baseball fans, my name is Dave from the Frontier League Journal. I hope you're doing well because I am doing amazing. Yes, I have been away. The coverage has not been there on the Frontier League Journal. I know about that. Uh, I've been employed for the past few weeks by the, Capi the Quebec City Capitals, so Equipe Quebec, and I will be for the foreseeable, foreseeable future, and I hope into the long term. Uh, it's going actually pretty pretty well i handle uh, some communications ticketing uh, the web uh, the webcasting too that we do uh, there were some mishaps on the first few days but we are working hard on uh, making the product very um, a high quality product so the frontier original is not dead it will go on it's just that right now i can just mix being with the team and also for those who do not know i am the owner of creative custom tattoo here in quebec city so i manage and i co-own the the tattoo parlor so it is um it is quite a um this is an endeavor that that takes a lot of time as does the Equip Quebec and uh, Quebec City Capitals uh, duties so i do not have that much time for the frontier league journal that being said Yes, I am back today with an interview because I wanted to talk to Tim Calderwood. Tim Calderwood is the voice of the Schomburg Boomers. And we go into a lot of things. As you'll see, this is an hour-long interview. And believe me, it is worth it. We go into the baseball business. We talk baseball. And we also go into some um, mental discussions you know what i mean uh he opens up a little it was an honor and a privilege to talk to him believe me so Equip quebec will be in schomburg tonight their first ever visit and i hope to god that tim comes to quebec next year i just want to shake his hand i just want to go grab a beer with the guy because he's so awesome as you'll see in a few seconds so if you are interested yes the frontier league journal will go on especially after this season because I'll have more free time on my hands and I'll have time to catch up and just talk to people, uh, make a lot of video interviews. I uh, Making this interview with Tim um, just reminded me how much I love doing this Frontier League Journal thing. And uh, that's pretty much it, man. So uh, without further ado, please welcome Tim Calderwood. And we are with Tim Calderwood. How are you, sir? My friend, it is so great to have a chance to talk to you. I know we were just mentioning, uh, I've missed the Frontier League Journal. It's been so great to have so many videos. You have no idea how much of a resource they are and how much time I've actually spent talking about you. So glad to have a chance to finally be on with you. Okay, uh, as I explained in the, in the intro, you are the voice of the uh, uh, Schomburg Boomers. Uh, tell me, and, and, and please, d don't flatter me too much, but how, how are they helping you? Because you see you were way way closer to the action than i was at the time so uh i think it's good to get an inside view from people who aren't within your organization right oh so one of my favorite interviews that you did was with eric minshaw the southern illinois pitching coach and just listening to different perspectives from people on what they think is happening in the league and how they're interpreting kind of these new stats and taking these new rules so stuff like that was neat. Um, and then obviously whenever we were playing a team and there was an interview from them, I went back and watched that. Uh, I was going to go interview Kyle Arjona. And so I actually watched the interview you did with Kyle and I was like, oh, let me see if there's anything fun in there that Dave asked that I can ask. Are you serious? Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, it's so, this is not the way I picture things. So <laughs> because I've missed it so much. People have to realize that I loved it so much. I love the uh, it. It's not going away at all. But I have to, I mean, there are uh, not enough time in a day. And with my two jobs, my, my business, and then the, the, the Equip Quebec, I mean, th there is not enough time right now in one day to do something that is not a high-paying job. Let's face it, there's no money to be made on the Frontier job. But, but it's so... Uh, it, it will go on, but okay, enough about me. Okay. <laughs> Tim, I, I want to talk about uh, how, how you came to be in the baseball world. So you're now the, the voice of the, of the boomers. You're a millionaire right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, how, did you, how did you get that job? How did you go into the baseball world? Well, if you by millionaire, you mean millions of pennies, then yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like me. No. Uh, so 
Um, the reality is when I was growing up as a kid, um, I was playing baseball and I fell in love with the game that way. And so what happened is I got to about age 12 and that's when kids start learning how to throw breaking balls. And I saw my first curveball and I ducked and got embarrassed and the umpire called strike one. And it was at that point that I realized my future was not on the field. <laughs> oh, can you remember that? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that crazy? So, uh, um, obviously being a fan so much of the game, I was watching a lot of the Cubs and, uh, Harry Carey was popular at the time. And I just kind of got that feeling that the connection he has with his viewers on a daily basis is something I wanted to do plus call baseball every day. So, I mean, that's kind of the route that I took. Um, and I guess the rest, as they say, is history. I mean, I worked, I went to college for communications. I was calling games in college. Um, after college, I went to a couple of summer ball leagues and did that before I got my first Frontier League job up in Traverse City, and I was there for three years. Um, then I moved to Ohio for a season. And then, uh, so I'm from Chicago originally, and Schaumburg's in the Chicago suburbs. So I, I started working for Gary in 2011, the Railcats. They're in the American Association, and they're the sister team of the Boomers. But the Boomers weren't around at that point. At the end of the 2011 season is when uh, our owner purchased the rights to Schaumburg and to the Boomers. So he asked me at the end of the year where I wanted to be. And I was like, well, Schaumburg's a lot closer to home for me. Um, I'm very familiar with the Frontier League. And uh, I'd love to have a chance to go over there and be part of, you know, starting something new. And so that's where I've been uh, ever since from the get-go of the Schaumburg Boomers here. And how is it to, to work with Mr. Larson and, uh, and all the, the team over there? I'm not going to lie. The amount of effort that this group puts in is incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if, even if you look through the pandemic and see a lot of uh, the events that we were still having at the ballpark as much as we could throughout last year when there was no baseball, um, I also think you're seeing it, you know, in the attendance numbers now. Schaumburg is leading the league in attendance. Um, I think we're second or third in all of the MLB partner leagues in attendance right now. Um, and that's a testament to the work that those guys have put in, Michael Larson and his entire staff. Um, I mean, they are really forward thinking. They're always thinking outside of the box. They always know that, you know, there needs to be many things happening at once instead of just the baseball game. For example, you've got to have all kinds of promotions and everything that goes into it. And they're really big on providing the whole family, the minor league baseball experience. And I think it's been awesome so far. Wow. And I think you have your biggest attendance ever, over 7,000 people in one day in uh, the end of June, beginning of July. Fourth of July. But, oh, it was the Fourth of July game. Oh, shit. It was the Fourth of July game, yeah. Seven what was crazy thousand. about that was, uh, I mean, those were all pretty much single tickets. They weren't groups. Um, and so that was about the time when, you know, the world and I guess the country in the U.S., I don't know what it was like in Canada, but in the U.S. it started to open up more around that time. So I think people were kind of anxious to get out and do something. And so it was really cool to see. It was a fun atmosphere. Unfortunately, uh, you know, Southern Illinois with Mike Pinto and Eric Minshaw, they uh, handed it to us pretty good that day. So there wasn't a whole lot for the crowd to cheer about at the start, but uh, it was still cool to be part of that atmosphere. So you were watching my interview with Eric Minshaw, you fucker, you fucker. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but seriously, um, I, I had an idea of what it was to be working um, on a team. So I work with the Capitals right now. Uh, I handle ticketing, I handle the, the communications and some things in the, in the organization. And you, you, you have an idea of the amount of work that it takes to put a product in the field and a product uh, on, in the stands and the, the, and the show and, the, the, and, and just the ushers and the, and, and the parking attendants. You have, you have an idea. So, okay, there must be like 20, 30, 50 people working at this. Oh no. Not even close. So it's it's a it's a lot of work. So do you handle other things uh, other than the and the the, the the communications and the uh, and being the voice of the boomers? Uh, so I actually have a full time off season job at a college. So I work at a small college in the area here. So this is kind of my summer job. So Jesus. I handle just uh, in the summer. I do all of the processing of the paperwork for the league, like just sending back and forth the rosters and then making sure that I'm writing the recaps, posting those online. And then obviously on the broadcast side of things too. So, yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> there's a lot, like you said, that happens. Um, and, and I think one thing that you'll realize in 
it's not just in baseball or minor league sports, but when you work in sports, your hands kind of involved in a little bit of everything. So even though those are my only minor roles, you know, there's still a lot of things that I'm hearing and providing input on and stuff like that. Minor roles. What are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean for, for me, you're the voice and, and I'm serious. I mean, when I think about the boomers, I mean, for me, of course, this is just one testimony, but I, I think about Tim Calderwood and I think about popcorn. Why is there a popcorn in your Twitter handle? <laughs> well, thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> by minor things, I mean, sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll uh, send Jamie Bennett a player that I've run into in the college level or something like that, and then uh, kind of help a little bit with planning some stuff here and there in the press box in terms of our game day administration. But uh, you bring up the popcorn, and uh, I got to give a shout out to Tom Galbraith who I actually worked for straight out of college, at a college, Loris College in Iowa, uh, where actually one of our front office members went, um, not when I was there, but so we had, uh, I, was, I, I was a graduate assistant. And as a GA, we all had a dorm on campus where we lived. So we all moved in around the same time. It was around this time of year. And uh, we just had this big kind of party to get to know everybody, because obviously we were all living together. And so I had a few adult soda pops and uh, <laughs> someone brought out a bowl of popcorn and put it on the other end of the table while we were playing cards. And apparently it has been told to me that I dove across the table, knocked everything off to get my hands into the bowl of popcorn. And so that's where the nickname popcorn was born. <laughs> Jesus, do people call you popcorn still today? Absolutely. Doesn't bother me at all. It's kind of, that's why it's the Twitter handle. I mean, I joke, it's a brand, right? So um, at Joliet, they have a window that doesn't open in their press box. Oh. So I sawed off a piece of wood that I had sitting around my house to use as a window prop to hold the window open. And on it, I wrote window prop courtesy of that TC popcorn. So now it <laughs> seems like every time somebody's going there, they're like, hey, Tim, you, we got your at TC popcorn here. So, yeah. <laughs> God damn, that's great. I have these, I love these stories. Uh, uh, you've been in, in the sports, uh, in a sports business or in the sports industry uh, and with the boomers for a long, long time. Do, do you still, not, not still feel the magic? Do you, have, do you still have the same passion for your job? Is it still, how do you challenge yourself? That's a great question. And honestly, it's a question and a conversation that I had a lot with myself over the COVID period. Um, because you really needed to kind of, I think everybody across the world needed to kind of take a look at themselves in the mirror in a little bit. Um, and so the honest answer is I didn't realize how much I missed it until I got here to start the 2021 season. I knew it was still going to be doing baseball this summer, but it wasn't until that first day that I stepped into the ballpark, sat down, and there was a game happening in front of me that I was like, wow, this is, uh, <laughs> this is where it's at. This is what I want to do. And I mean, people often ask me, you know, why, why did you choose baseball over other sports? And to me, the honest answer is because you just don't know what you're going to get from day to day. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, one day, so we got no hit by Joliet earlier this year. So you can have a no hitter come your way. And the next day you can score 15 runs or you can score 15 runs and get no hit the next day. Like there's just so much that happens on a daily basis. And for me, it's become so much about going through the ride and kind of experience things along with the team. And that's where that drive kind of comes from because, you know, obviously I'm in a unique perspective of being around the team on a daily basis that you kind of go through the ups and downs with them. So that provides that little bit of attachment, which I think then, you know, as long as you have that and you can still feel that connection, then you should be energized and jazzed up, which I am. And plus, I mean, I'm in a ballpark every day. Who can beat that? Right. Exactly. Exactly. And you've had some great conversations with uh, Terry Bonaduna too. He seems to be a good friend of yours. Yeah, Terry's been around for a little while in the league. So, yeah, we know each other pretty well. Uh, but it's, it's been an interesting year, obviously, with COVID. There's a lot of new faces around, not just, you know, in the broadcast side, but on the field, too, and with some new teams coming in. Um, I do think that's one of the unique perspectives that I have is I've gotten to know a lot of other teams' managers. And, you know, sometimes there's players, obviously, that come through Schaumburg that end up on other teams. So you got that kind of little connection going on, even with other clubhouses and you meet people in the front offices when you're on the road. So I kind of view it as every time we go on the road, a little bit like a homecoming because chances are there's somebody that I'm going to run into that I'll be able to know and have a conversation with and share some stories. Exactly. Wow. I love it, man. Um, 
Uh, and you have a unique pers perspective for my next question. You've, you've lived through the years where the Frontier League was this runaway league, independent league, with, with kind of a weird structure when it came to player eligibility. Uh, a, a structure I was not really happy with, especially with the fact that for so many years in Quebec, we had the Canem League and the Northern League, where the veteran players were a, a, a staples of, a, or a mainstay in the lineup. I mean, you get used to those, Edil Antigua or those, I don't, I don't know, but... The, 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 the roster rules change, and now we have the, the Can-Am and the Frontier League, which who just merge together. And what do you think, how do you see the league right now? Do you like it better that way, or what is your perspective on it? So I forgot to mention up when we were talking about my journey to Schaumburg, um, I actually grew up coming to games here in Schaumburg when there were the Flyers in the Northern League, um, oh, which, we yeah. joke, which we joke is kind of an effort in our office. <laughs> <laughs> Because we wanted to establish ourselves as our own unique team, obviously. Yeah. Um, so I do know a little bit about having seen some of the Northern League teams. And obviously, I was in the American Association, so I got to see that a little bit as well. I think um, I, I would say TBD on what it's going to be like with the Can-Am still. Um, I think one of the things that I won't say it bothered me, because obviously, we're playing baseball, which is the most exciting thing about it. But the schedule this year, I mean, we had 18 games against Joliet, 18 games against Windy City. So you're not really leaving the area very much. And so I didn't get a chance to go out and see any of those teams out east. Mm -hmm. um, even a Washington, who I have friends over there, and I'm, obviously they've been in the league. So you've got really good relationships. So I haven't had a chance to see any of them. And uh, tonight, this week, is going to be the first time we face somebody from out east. So, we yeah, I know, back. right? <laughs> I hope we kill you. Oh, wait, did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I really did that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I think it's going to be really interesting to see moving forward, you know, what happens in terms of the roster makeups around the league. Um, obviously, we had Willie Garcia to start the year. He's now in Tri-City. I mean, those kind of players didn't come around in the old Frontier League. Um, so it's going to be interesting. This is a group, the league itself is kind of known for being a younger league, right? That's why they have so many rookies that you need to have on your roster to begin with. And I think that helps in terms of players getting noticed right at the beginning of the year it was player after player after player that was getting signed out of the league this year um, and there's a lot of reasons for that obviously but I think one of the biggest things with that is you know you're kind of getting guys in their prime right so you got the 24 25 26 year olds that you know can step in you're not getting somebody who's 28 29 on the back end of their career necessarily um, and not to say that those guys are on the back end of their career I mean obviously Willie Garcia's had a great season since he went to Tri-City and he struggled with injuries when he was here and he had a tremendous season in uh, Winnipeg a couple of years ago. And we've got a guy in Jake Joyce and Angelo Gums. So you're getting those older players that I think um, the younger guys, it actually helps because they get a chance to kind of see what they do and learn from the guys who have been around the game a little bit more rather than kind of that fresh face coming straight out of college. And I think the Frontier League is in a, a unique position where the, the, uh, you, you got to have a minimum of 10 rookies, which, which is insane because it gives the college players so much opportunities and you have the veterans and it's not too much. Three, I think, it, it is a good deal when it comes to the Frontier League when they don't want to have too much, like in the, uh, the Atlantic League. So I think this is a very, very good mix. I love the Frontier League for that, by the way. Um, and... <sighs> I, 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 how could I put this? Okay. Uh, I wish there was a way we could add some more veterans and uh, that we could keep those players because I get attached to these guys, but I, I, I want them to have their opportunities, but in, at the same time, I want to keep them. It's, it's so weird. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, I absolutely know what you're saying. I think that's part of one of the reasons why the Frontier League maybe around 2016 kind of changed their classification rules again because fans come to the ballpark and they kind of grow a connection to these players in some mm -hmm. ways. Um, so we've got Jake Joyce, who I mentioned earlier, he's in his fifth season with the team. Um, we've got a lot of players who have kind of grown from rookie one to rookie two to experience. Daryl Thompson is one of those guys. Mm -hmm. So you got kind of a chance to see them grow along with, you know, the rest of the league and watch them develop. I mean, in the case of Daryl Thompson, I'll never forget. Um, he'll tell you right away. Like he came to us, we needed a starter. He started a game and they were like, you know what? We don't necessarily think starting is the best spot for you, but we think you'll be great as a reliever. 
and he has absolutely grabbed that role and just run with it in his time with the team since. Um, and so that's a great example. And I mean, I think, you know, obviously we had uh, Jake Cousins was in Schaumburg in 2019, and now he's up in the big leagues with the Brewers. Um, it's not necessarily that you're always going to have those kind of players, but it is fun to kind of watch guys develop a little bit more rather than getting them shipped out from one city to another. You know, if you're ready to go from low A to high A, you're leaving town. You don't get to watch that development in person. Yeah, and, I, and this is a great segue because I wanted to, that there's two things I want to talk about, Boomer's Baseball, obviously, and also you wanted to know how to pronounce some names on Equip Quebec, so we'll get into that in a few minutes, but let's talk some Boomer's Baseball. Jake Joyce, you just mentioned him, he's um, entertaining, he keeps things interesting, I mean, it can be pinpoint one one batter and the next he doesn't even you know there is a, a strike zone it, it's in, it's insane i mean it keeps things interesting but at the same time um how do you deal with that when you're on the team <laughs> well i think from a broadcast perspective it's always buckle up <laughs> <laughs> um and i love jake to death and obviously uh, he's been around for a while here um one of the things that he's done is kind of talking about his development phase is he's added slowly some more pitches to his repertoire. And I think it's a case of when he goes out to the mound, just kind of, you got to go back to what works. And I think in a lot of cases, he was kind of playing around with some things rather than going at it. So um, for whatever reason, historically during his career in Schaumburg, he has struggled at the start of the season and then he's gone through and been almost hittable for the rest of the year. So oh. we, we saw kind of that phase at the beginning where he was struggling. And then he did have, I think, eight to 10 outings or so where he was basically untouchable. And now he's had a couple of rough ones again. So I think it's just kind of, as is the case with anything, leveling the roller coaster a little bit. I think, uh, you know, in terms of teammates, you just got to trust that your, your teammates going to do their job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I, I think that everybody, the, the role, and I guess the mantra of this team is to make it better for the guy behind you. Mm -hmm. And so that's the case, you know, I mean, Jamie Bennett has always preferred pitchers, who pitch to contact and keep the defense going. That's why we've never really had a lot of high strikeout pitchers on the starting staff. So I think you just got to be ready as a fielder to know that, hey, the ball is going to be in play or there's a possibility that there's going to be runners on base here and, and go from there. But I think at the end of the day, obviously, I mean, he's been around for a while. So you, you know who he is. You know what he's going to do when he comes into the ball game. Mm. You've seen the pitching coach come and go. How has uh, Connor Reed impacted the pitching staff this year? Because I've talked to him. He's a great guy. He's very laid back. And I, I think he's, he's looking for exactly the type of pitcher that Bennett is looking for, obviously. But also, he was that type of pitcher, not striking out at all, but he was allergic to walks. <laughs> Being allergic to walks is a good thing. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, I actually watched your conversation with Connor at the start of the year. And uh, I, I, I think Connor would tell you that the hardest adjustment to make is from player to coach especially when it's player to coach of guys you played with because there are players on the Schaumburg team that were teammates with Connor. Yeah. Um, and, and what I will say about it is he has absolutely a hundred percent stepped in. And to me, he, he is a coach now. Mm -hmm. um, he looks like a coach. He talks like a coach, but he's got that connection to the players still because he's not that far removed from them. And I think that's a really unique situation to have. And I think it helps because I think in a lot of cases, you know, if a coach is telling you something, you don't necessarily want to listen to it, right? You'll kind of shrug it off and say, ah, whatever. But in this case, you know, you can get kind of a fresh set of eyes um, from someone who's actually been in the game as recently as a year ago. Mm -hmm. So I think that's been the biggest thing. And um, I mean, it's been interesting because there's a younger coaching staff this year with Bryce Davis as the hitting coach and Connor Reed as the pitching coach to watch them develop as well. And I think that I mean, the way they've been able to grow has been incredible. And obviously you saw Tony Smith, who was our pitching coach, was kind of in the same boat. He transitioned from player to pitching coach and did so well that his career has now moved on into the Tigers organization. So oh. I think it's kind of a natural lineage to move along. And that's one of the things that I love about Jamie Bennett in that clubhouse is he's so laid back. He kind of lets you do your own thing, but he also guides you and puts you in position to be successful. Mm -hmm. And I think Connor is definitely – done a great job with this team and it hasn't been without challenges that's for sure especially you know on a starting pitching perspective side right now we're basically down a starter and they're trying to figure out every week how to fill that void so. yeah you lost Orlando or Rodriguez and did you lose uh 
you, you lost uh, Aaron Rosek too. Am I crazy? They're yeah. both on the same team, which is even crazier. Yeah, are, are along, you with, along with two other Frontier League pitchers. They're in the Fort Myers, Florida, which is the low A affiliate of the Twins. They're the Fort Myers Mighty Muscles. Oh. And I call it Schaumburg South because there's Aaron Rosick, there's Orlando Hernandez. Their hitting coach is Derek Showman, who was on Jamie Bennett's staff prior to this year. And their assistant hitting coach is Raiden Sierra, who was on the Boomers in 2019. So it's kind of funny how that small world connection works. Oh my God, nice. <laughs> and, and just to, to, uh, to talk about what you mentioned uh, before, and I think you can testify to it. I, I, I've learned very, very quickly that um, there is more to the performance on, on, on the field. What I mean by that, being close to the team, you understand that there is the personal lives of the players. And so many times we say, yeah, trade him for him, trade him for him, trade him for him, and, and do that. Do, why are you bad? Go hell. I mean, yeah, but just take into consideration that there is a, 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 ma a machinations to all this. I mean, you have to travel. You have to, I mean, you've got lives, you've got girlfriends, you've got wives uh, at home, you've got, uh, are your kids uh, hurt or something? So you've got to realize that th there are personal lives involved. And th th I think this is one of the most uh, eye-opening experience that I've had where uh, I've learned a lot of, of things from players on Equip Quebec, not bad things, just regular things that we all go through but we some somehow think that baseball players are just baseball player then they go to their caves and then they go back is that crazy so i no it's not at all i think uh i mean this is a good chance i guess to talk about mental health a little bit um my myself during the pandemic battled through a lot of mental health issues um and it's just It happens, right? Baseball is a game of failure. Mm -hmm. um, when you think about the players, right? The best players in baseball, seven out of 10 times are going to fail. Mm -hmm. So how you respond to that failure is where that mental component comes in. And we just had a guy who was with us, uh, Frank Fister, who was our third baseman in 2012 and 2013. He came around for a week uh, during our last homestand and was just hanging out with the guys. And he was a mental health specialist. He was a mental skills coach is what it was called for the Reds. And so you, you realize how much goes into it because you bring up those other things that all it takes is one little issue to be in the back of your head and it's there and not going away and it's going to affect how you perform. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just saw it in the Olympics with Simone Biles for Team USA in the gymnastics to the point where she almost forgot what she was doing midair and could have really hurt herself because her mind was so distracted. So I think that, um, I think we all, and like I said, th this kind of speaks personally to me a little bit need to kind of realize that, you know, there's a lot more to life than what you see. <laughs> and it, it's, it's crazy to think about, but I've been confronting a lot of voices in my head and you're just like, where is this stuff coming from? So it's, yeah. it's really weird. And I mean, again, it is kind of cool to see the human element of these guys as well, but that's where it becomes so hard. And I actually had a conversation with someone recently. I was like, I don't know how a game of failure doesn't weigh on people right and and situations too where guys are getting released and having other opportunities elsewhere like it's a game set up to fail and at some point you're going to meet the end and there's somebody going to be there to tell you you're not good enough to do it anymore and how do you how do you respond to that and how do you face adversity is a whole entire question that you know is is something that's really unique and i think more so front and center in baseball than the other sport Uh, feel free to tell me to back off, uh, but I have a question because you, you seem to open up and I think my question at home a little. Uh, was it baseball related or, or uh, more personal, your issues? What I mean by that is, did you feel that you missed baseball more than you thought you would? So um, I've been battling depression and anxiety for a little over a year now. Yeah. Um, well, I guess it started, it started last summer, so it's been longer than a year. Um, and I think, uh, looking at it, what kind of brought it to the forefront was the lack of baseball, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Wow. Um, and in a lot of cases, you know, I use the summers to distract myself and I get invested in the team and what's happening. And without that consistency, 
um, not being able to go to the ballpark, not really being able to go anywhere for that matter mm -hmm. last summer, it really started to weigh and some of these other things that are in the depths of who knows where in my head started to come out and really manifest themselves. And so um, I, I think, you know, even more so than anything else for, for my own mental health, having baseball back this year has been awesome um, to be around and to see. And yeah, I mean, like I said, it's just, it's a, uh, it's a constant battle. We'll put it that way. But um, yeah, no, it was definitely not caused by baseball. I would say if anything, it was kind of the absence of baseball that went to it. And I'm actually going to show you. Uh, so I'm in my broadcast booth right here. And I don't know how well you can see this, but this is Drew Robinson. Okay. Um, and I, I keep this card with me uh, to remind me of Drew. Uh, I have no personal connection to Drew other than um, Drew uh, suffered through depression and attempted suicide last spring during the pandemic. And he's a baseball player. He was with the Giants at the time. And uh, he shot his eye out is what ended up happening. Oh my God, I heard about that. Oh shit. Yeah. So he ended up coming back and working hard and he had like kind of a revelation, you know, I really want to live. And so I have him as a reminder constantly in front of me. Um, but the small world story is, so he went into spring training this year and ended up making their AAA team. Um, and the guy who got to tell me made the team was Kyle Haynes, whose brother Andy used to be a manager for the Windy City Thunderbolts and is now uh, a big league coach with the Brewers. And Kyle was the starting shortstop for the Gary South Shore Railcats in 2011. So there's also, you know, one, something we haven't mentioned is kind of baseball. There's always like a six degrees of separation thing. Somehow, some way, someone's connected to someone that you know somewhere. I got goosebumps, man. God damn. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, it, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, one more question. Uh, the car that you have right now, did you, did you seek it or, or did it end up in your hand for some reason? Uh, that's the absolute crazy part, Dave. So you obviously um, have watched a few of our games. Pardon my reach here, by the way. Um, I have this bag and it is filled with just packs of cards. Keep some for me. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll, I'll bring some next year when we hopefully come north of the border, huh? Oh, you better. Uh, but uh, so I just, I opened baseball cards and I got back into baseball card collecting as a result of just kind of opening cards and finding something. And there's always six degrees of separation there. And so this literally came out of a random pack that I opened during the pandemic while I was going through these mental struggles after I had just heard about his story. So it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a little chilling to see that and be like, Oh my goodness. Wow. My God. And I mean, when the team loses or when the team wins, is it easy to get caught up in that or where, uh, yeah, the team loses, but you're still Tim, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> no, but, but, but I, I think my question makes sense. Yeah, no. So, um, I have a joke with a couple of my broadcast friends. The only thing we ever ask for is a good, quick game. <laughs> <laughs> win, win, or lose, win or lose, it's okay by me as long as it was entertaining and it was quick. Um, so a manager that I worked with in the Frontier League in Lake Erie, his name was John Massarelli. I, I went to him and I said, John, how are we going to – Maz is what they call him. So I didn't say John. I said, Maz, how are we going to do this year? He says, Tim, I tell you what, we're going to win 30 games. We're going to lose 30 games. It's those other 30 games that are going to determine whether we'll be good or bad. So I've kind of taken on that mantra a little bit. And I think, you know, talking about Jamie Bennett, he's the same way. Like I'll go in and talk to him after a loss. You know, I went in and talked to him after we got no hit and he was talking the same way as he was before the game. It didn't bother him. So I think having that personality to kind of lean back on and the players see it too, obviously they know that he's not going to jump down their throat if they're not getting a hit. Um, and they know that he's not going to be like jumping up and down and screaming when they're doing well either. So he's the same kind of even keeled guy. And I mean, that's the way that I feel. I always feel like, obviously, like I told you, everything's different every day with baseball. Mm -hmm. So I always just sit back and I'm like, all right, well, where's this, where's today's tour going to take me? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen today? How is it going to go? And, and then it's how you kind of respond to it and go along that journey um, that, that takes you to that point. So when you have blowouts either for or against, that's where you got to get creative and find some more stories. And, you know, I can dig into the well and dig deep into my frontier league experiences and talk about different things that have happened and stories along the way that go with that. Ain't that great to be leaning, uh, well, leaning and just be around people who inspire you. I mean, 
like Patrick Scalabrini, the, the manager for, uh, for Equipe Quebec, and Charles Demers, the, the GM, Jean Grignon Frank, who was with the team, they're working so hard. I've never been in an organization in my life where everybody was pushing in the right direction and I was not the only one. Come on, come on. You know what I mean? So, I, I mean, I, so I, I, it's great to see that you're, we shared that common bond where people that you, you can lean on people just by the way they're acting. They're not saying anything to you, but the way they're acting is like, Keep it easy, man. It's a baseball game. We've given <laughs> our we trust the process in a way. I think uh, a good leadership philosophy is it always starts at the top, right? Mm -hmm. So how you want your organization to look, whether that be the on-field organization or the off-the-field organization, like you're talking about with Michael Larson, it's always feeding off of that person who's leading the way. And when you have people who feed into that system and believe in that system along the way, it just makes it so easier for everybody else. And I think that totally holds true on the field as well as off the field, like I was saying. And I mean, it's, I can't envision anything else to be honest with you, Dave. It's been, it's been so exciting and I hope you're getting a chance to experience it a little bit up there in Quebec now. And did you get a chance to go to the games when you guys were in town? This is exactly what I was going to say. I mean, the, that was the first time that I was in, in the press box, actually. And it's a no okay. press box. So I see your press box that, that you, you, you've got around you right now. This is a luxury that you have, by the way. I mean, th this is not at all what we have in Quebec. But this is, I'll say, maybe ours is more charming in a way. But Here, I'll give oh, you a tour. Oh, yes. So there's the ballpark. Oh, my God. This, this is my baby Yoda, Grogu. <laughs> <laughs> then I got, uh, I showed you the Drew Robinson. There's a stadium map that I have there to reference. Those are my in-game reads. I've got uh, Jamie Bennett and Coop bobbleheads over here. <laughs> nice. And then uh, you can see I've got a diffuser and a lava lamp on the ground. I've got a, uh, it's, it fell over recently, but that's my uh, Himalayan salt lamp. There's my microphone. Um, and we got the orange backdrop here too. So I mean, like I said, how can you not um, look at this as your backdrop every day? Like I come into the office and I sit down and this is what I see. Wow, wow. <laughs> so wow. it's really uh, it's really something that, you know, it's, it's hard to not get motivated when you have that and realize that, yeah, you're working and yeah, this is sports and it's a job, but at the same time, it's sports and it's a job and you're working in sports. And yeah. one of the things I was thinking about recently was, uh, you know, um, one of the big reasons I got into sports was because I didn't want to be involved in an atmosphere where things were too serious. Like our job is to provide entertainment. That's what I do every night, I hope. And that's what our front office does every day. And that's what our players do, right? They're there to provide entertainment and be a distraction from the real world. So I felt like that was a good place for me to, uh, to, to be. And obviously that's where I've been. And so it's been exciting. And like I said, I was glad to see that you guys had a chance to get home for that six game series a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, three, uh, three games in Quebec and three games in trois Uh it, it was a success. Sold out in Quebec for three games. Uh, sold out for the first game. Uh, was it sold out in trois Yeah, I don't think so. But, um, I, I, I mean, I, I'm eager to see you in town. And we haven't talked baseball. Okay, do you have 10, min 10 more minutes? I got 10 more minutes. Yes, I know you all of all of your interviews I know are dictated by your guests and I told myself I was going to be the short one and I know I'm going to end up being on the long side. I don't want okay. you to be the short one. I mean dude, this is so <laughs> interesting and if people don't like this discussion that we have right now, you have no business being on the Frontier League Journal to be quite honest with you. Come on, <laughs> it's so interesting. No, I mean you you're opening up and and I love it. Uh, you just announced uh, I got the, uh, the the press release. You just uh, traded for Braxton Davidson. Huge bat, former for first rounder for the Atlanta Brave. Uh, he's a huge strikeout guy, but when he connects, and he's been connecting lately and for the past month, month and a half, the guy has huge power upside. You're kind of in a small losing streak right now. Uh, you've uh, you've lost seven of your uh, ten, uh, last ten games. Um, have you talked to Jamie Bennett about this acquisition? So I knew it was in the cards. Jamie told me they were working on trying to get him. Uh, I mean, the short story of it is we lost Quincy Deporti and Nick Ames literally on the same day. Mm -hmm. And those were both of our first basemen. So uh, I think that we had the opportunity to, to see what life was like without them for a little while. And I think that void was in the lineup, trying to find someone who had that big hit who could change the game. I mean, Jamie Bennett told me more than once, 
Quincy Neporty did a very good job of kind of hiding our problems from time to time oh. because because he would come to the plate and you'd be down a couple runs and there'd be a guy on base and he did a three run homer and the game would change just like that. Mm-hmm. So the fact that um, that's been missing a little bit lately has kind of opened up some other areas and, and the team has certainly tried to account for it. One of the biggest things is they've been a much more aggressive running team lately, mm-hmm. uh, which has been fun to see. But I mentioned earlier that Joliet, you know, we, we see them 18 times this year. So you had a pretty good idea of, of what kind of player Braxton Davidson is. Um, and I think, you know, even with me initially, the first couple of times that I saw him, I was like, oh, this guy's, he's struggling a little bit. He's really high in the strikeout mm-hmm. area. Um, but then you start to see it a little bit more and you look at it a little differently. And this is what I love, um, being able to take kind of a different perspective into the game of baseball now. Like, it's not as much about batting average anymore, right? You look at, so the on-base percentage and the slugging percentage of Braxton Davidson are incredible. And I think that, those are two things that you can put right into the middle of our lineup at first base, where we obviously have an absence right now with two guys out um, and can help us not even stay afloat, but win the division. Um, And I think that's kind of what we've been waiting for is that difference to come. And we've been waiting for this team to kind of take off. There were signs of it before we went into this last stretch, you know, we had that five and one homestand where we swept Lake Erie and you're like, this team's going to run away in the central, but, um, then they kind of came back to earth again. And you're still like, how is it that we're not five to six mm-hmm. games up right now? I mean, it's a race. There are three teams decided by five games in the central division yeah. after Windy city swept us. So I think that's the biggest thing is they're hoping this is a difference maker who can really start to separate us from the rest of the pack. Hmm. Quincy Neporty, uh, is he going to going to be back this season? So, uh, I haven't heard a report recently as to what, Uh, his status is he's on the 14 day injured list so obviously he's out for at least that Um, Jamie Bennett tells me it depends on who you ask (laughs) Uh Um, because it's it's just got it's an injury in the foot that's just got to heal basically so it depends on how quickly it heals and how comfortable Quincy feels with it to where he can come back and obviously we are very hopeful that you know we can get that bat for the playoff push in the last couple weeks of the season um him with Braxton Davidson is, would be an absolutely incredible combo in the middle of the lineup, That's especially it. since one's a righty and one's a lefty. So exactly. I know we're all hoping. Um, I will tell you that Quincy Neporty, uh, the year that he was having, there's there are guys that I call must watch players. Um, and by that, I mean, when they come to the plate, you have to stop everything you're doing and watch their at bats, right? There's a few of them in the big leagues that happen. And somebody will probably laugh at me when I say Aaron judge. But with the Yankees, every time Aaron Judge comes to the plate, I turn on a Yankees game, I want to watch Aaron Judge, and I want to see what's going to happen. Um, And he was one of those guys, and he was having a tremendous start to the season, on pace to set all kinds of records. He was leading in the Triple Crown in the Frontier League. And uh, it was just – I I was heartbroken for him when he went down with the injury. Um, And obviously, like I said, you hope he comes back strong and ready to go, and I think we'll see what happens down the line. That, that is a big question for me. How is this guy? Okay, numbers do not lie, but they don't tell the whole story. What the hell am I missing with Quincy Neporti not being at least in affiliated ball? Is that, I mean, okay, I, I don't even know if you can go into it. Is that an athleticism thing? I mean, is, is it a fact that he's not, he cannot play more than one person? I, I have no idea. I'm not making a, a commentary. I'm really actually asking the question. The guy should not be in the front of your league right now. I do not disagree with you at all. Uh, to which I will say, as we were talking about all those players getting picked up from the league earlier in the year, what position were they all? That's a great, that's a great question. Outfielders? All pitchers. Right. So just oh, think about from our oh, perspective. Okay, okay. I, I thought you meant uh, f- fielders, fielders. Okay. Oh, no, 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 okay. no. So most of the players who have been picked up from the frontier league this year are pitchers because everybody's always looking for arms. Yeah. I think, I, I mean, the honest answer is the fact that Quincy's a first baseman. I think a lot of teams look at first base as a position where they can always find somebody who can do it. Mm-hmm. And that's not a knock at all against Quincy because he's amazing at it. He's the best player in the league in my mind. Of course. Um, I just think the fact that, say if he were like a a left fielder or a third baseman, it might be a little bit different perspective than playing first base, but especially with the modern game, people are looking for that kind of player specifically at the corner infield spot. And so I think that unfortunately ends up working against him. And one of the reasons why he's, he's been here. And again, I, 
I hope he gets a chance because, I mean, he's got a big league bat and we've had a chance to see it firsthand, which has been amazing. He's been the player of the week for me for the last 12 weeks, man. <laughs> Come on. He's <laughs> insane. I mean, I, I, anyway. Okay, I, I want to talk about a few things. Um, uh, Willie Garcia, what happened there? Because this is the bat that you were looking for in a way. I mean, you announced him. Uh, would it be fair to say without telling it that there was something on the, uh, going on that we cannot talk about? I don't think so. Okay. I mean, he was, he was really liked in the clubhouse. I think, and I think you asked me that question. I actually took me a little bit to kind of come back with it. And, and the honest answer is just that there weren't a lot of at bats to go around at that time. Okay. There are now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, uh, so when you have a chance to uh, send him somewhere where, you know, he's going to get a chance to play every day. Um, in our case here, someone was going to always be sitting out of the lineup with Willie in it. And whether that was Willie taking a day off or Quincy or Nick Ames, um, someone was going to have to be out of the lineup because they just, there's only one DH and only one right fielder and first baseman. So mm -hmm. it was a situation where there just weren't a lot of at bats to go around for him. And I think the emergence of guys like Chase Dawson honestly made that a little bit of an easier move to make um, because they felt good about some of the other pieces that they wanted to keep giving at bats to. And so I, I just think that, I mean, that's, that's all it ended up being. And as far as I know, just a, a fact of you know, there's somebody has got to sit <laughs> and we don't want it to necessarily be him because he's a veteran. He's got big league experience and he's, you know, our highest paid player. And so uh, we can't sit him. So we got to find somewhere for him to go to make everything else work. Basically. That makes sense. Would it be fair to say that this is the same situation with the Martellini? Because Nick Odo, obviously, is a leader in the clubhouse, from what I heard. He's a great guy, too. I mean, are you going to sit him just to give it bats to Martellini, who's thriving right now with the, with the boulders? Yeah. I think Gian just needed an opportunity to play, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, look, backup catcher is probably the, the hardest position in baseball. Because when you come into a team like Schaumburg and you have an established veteran catcher in Nick Odo, you know you're not going to be playing every day. Mm. And so that has to eat at you a little bit too when you're going back to talking about the mental health side. You get those voices in your head saying, I need to be playing, I need to be playing, I need to be playing. And so I think that, uh, you know, the opportunity arose to give him a chance to play every day. And obviously the boulders have loved what he's done. And so, yeah, I would say it was very similar to that situation with him. Okay, perfect. Is there, are there players that you want to talk about right now that maybe are overlooked just a little, just maybe one or two, either on the pitching side or the uh, offensive side? Can I start with Kyle Arjona? <laughs> of course, why not? I mean, how can this guy be overlooked is my question. I keep asking it every time he goes out to the mound. You talk about, uh, I was mentioning, you know, how Quincy Neporti is a stop everything and watch guy when he came to the plate. It's the same way with Arjona on the mound. He goes out there and literally in my head, he, seven straight starts of seven innings or more, mm -hmm. which is crazy to me. Uh, he just goes out there and he competes. And I mean, he's a Jamie Bennett guy. He's not going to overpower you. He's going to throw a lot of strikes. There's going to be a lot of balls put in play, but they're not going to be hard hit. They're going to be on the ground. Uh, if he has some base runners against him, he's going to fight his way through adversity. So it's hard to say that a guy who leads the league in innings has been up there in wins and strikeouts and uh, ERA all season is overlooked, mm -hmm. but I definitely feel like that's the case with him. Um, so, I mean, I would throw him right to the forefront and then Ryan Middendorf right behind him. Absolutely. who's a guy that we, we chose in the frontier league draft. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind, he's coming off of his senior season of college this year coming to us. And he's thrown, I think close to 75 innings or so with us on top of his college season. Mm -hmm. And he's still going strong. Um, so, I mean, those are two guys on the pitching staff that I would go to right away. Uh, Thomas Nicole at the back end of our bullpen has really emerged to the point where he's been unhittable, which is why Jamie Bennett's been giving him the ball a lot of late. Um, position player wise, I brought up Chase Dawson, obviously, uh, the year he's had has been incredible and was, I think, kind of overshadowed a little bit by the year Quincy DePorty was having, mm -hmm. to be honest with me. He doesn't have the same kind of power numbers, but he can find the gaps. I mean, he's tied for the league lead in triples. Besides having six home runs, and he's in the top five in batting average. So you've got that going for you. Um, I'm trying to just go around the infield and think of some other guys. Uh, I, like, I, I, like, I like Alec Craig. Yeah, I like Craig. Craig. At the beginning of the season, his at-bats were 
so professional. I'm not saying they're not right now, but he was finding a way to get on base every damn time. <laughs> he's back to that. <laughs> oh, no, he's back to that. Nice. Yeah. Uh, on Sunday, he got on base five times with four walks. Only. So, only. Yeah. <laughs> and the one thing that makes Alec so unique is Jamie Bennett can literally put him anywhere in the lineup. Mm -hmm. And Luke Becker's the same way. And by lineup, I mean anywhere on the field because mm -hmm. um, those are guys that are so versatile. So you can give somebody a day off at second base and throw in mm -hmm. Alec Craig at second. You can give a third baseman a day off and throw Alec Craig at third, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, Craig is also um, – I won't necessarily say that his at-bats are must-watch, but when he's on base, it's much watched because I always had that sense. He's already set our single-season record for steals and attempts. So that's what's been making this a little bit fun of late to watch kind of the base running develop a little bit. Okay, perfect. Tim, you want to get to work? Yes. Okay, perfect. So what we'll do right now is, uh, Tim, uh, just to put people in perspective, um, Tim uh, messaged me on Twitter and he said, well, Dave, you'll have to help me with some of the pronunciation for the Equipped Quebec uh, players because obviously some of them are uh from quebec so they're french canadian and the, the pronunciation is maybe a little more um difficult and that's okay i mean french is a very very difficult language to learn uh what i wanted to ask you before uh before we get into it how, how do you process it uh usually when there are japanese players latin uh, uh, people from uh, south america or the dominican republic do you go and ask the the people on the other side the manager the the, the communications assistant or something like that and they help you pronounce those names <laughs> the honest answer is i've learned uh, to never trust the manager or coach's pronunciation <laughs> of a <the> player <laughs> so i usually go, i usually go straight to the source to be honest with you when it comes to that oh uh, and obviously uh i mean there's some really unique names coming up with quebec which is why i reached out to you i was like I got to sound like I know what I'm doing here. And they always told me the biggest thing is to be confident in how you're saying things. Uh, so I, I could definitely be confident, but I also want to be confident that I'm right, which is yeah, yeah, yeah. the biggest thing too. So, it's so, so yeah, I mean, we've had, we've had players from Japan and I mean, the Dominican Republic. And I mean, the great thing about baseball is it is a universal language in a lot of ways, right? Kind of like soccer is the same way or football, depending on what, how you call it. Um, it's played all over the world and everybody knows it. So you can still kind of speak the languages without uh, confusing people too much. So, yeah. And people who speak in French who may, may hear you tonight. Um, oh yeah, I mean, it, it's awesome. So you'll have all the province of Quebec uh, looking at you because I think a third of all the subscriptions from the Frontier League TV are actually from Quebec. Which is awesome. <laughs> anyway. I mean, a third, man. It, it's insane. Wow, okay. Okay, that, that, that was the last figure that I got. Um, when it comes to um, some, of those, some of those names, if you make the effort of, of just saying the, the, the right word in French, people will appreciate that. Because some of those sounds you've never pronounced in your life, as me with uh, Japanese, uh, Japanese sounds or even uh, English sounds, as you can see right now in this interview, I, I barely speak English. So uh, do you want to, to, to start easy and get into it with uh, Evan Rutsky? Uh, Rutsky is the left-hander, uh, the Canadian, okay. the six foot five. Yeah. Okay, it's Evan Rutsky. 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 So Rutsky. it's like okay. R-O-O-T. And uh, ski like in um, S K S K I Rootski. Got here. Rootski. Okay. And that's it. Hold on. Pardon me. I'm gonna start taking some notes here, Dave. <laughs> and, and, and how do you do it? Do, do you do you do you um, write it as you hear it? Yes. Okay. Perfect. There you go. So that I when I see it, I know how to say it based off of writing it down. Nice. So, so that's for even uh, R. How is it? How is it spelled? R R U T C K Y G something like that. It's insane. Yeah, it's R U T C K Y J. I've got the ah. roster open right in front of me. So oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, uh, the 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 lead of hitter will be, I think, um, uh, L P Pelletier. Okay, Pelletier. Yeah. So his his name uh, his first name is Louis Philippe, but everybody uh, calls him L P, and uh, Pelletier. So I don't know how to, how to teach you. So does that make any sense when I say Peltier? Peltier. Yeah, that's perfect. 
LP PLTA. That's even better than me. Done. <laughs> and, and do you want to know a fun fact about him? Yes. Okay, he was on, on a show called Occupation Double, which is like your um, uh, big brother. Okay. This, 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 but it, it's for couples. So they, they go on an island or they go somewhere in the world and they get matched up and they and all kinds of adventures and something like that happens. So he got into the auditions uh, um, uh, cl clothed as a baseball player and he got the part. <laughs> That's crazy. Yes, it is. Uh, th there is also the, uh, our second baseman is David Glode. Glode, okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're adding on a first try. I would have said Glaudy, see? So I'm glad I'm no, talking no, to you. No, no, Glode, Glode. Glode, David Glode. Yeah. Deal. So, so like your word in English, rode, I rode the horse. So yes. Glode. Um, yeah. Also, there is, uh, do you know how to pronounce uh, Gift and Gope, the shortstop? Um, I saw his pronunciation on... A page that I was looking at yesterday, so I kind of cheated on that one. But <laughs> go ahead and say, it. Uh, is it is it Ufe or something like that? No, Ngope. Gift Ngope. Ngope. Okay. Ngope. It's it's all, almost as you were reading it. Is it is gift? Yeah, gift. Gift Ngope. Okay. Exactly. So the center fielder is um, Jonathan Lacroix. 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 Okay. This one is a because the the X at the end you do not pronounce. So my wife told me when I was showing her the roster, I was like, "Look at these names." She thought of Lacroix water right away, which apparently is what we call it here, Lacroix water. So it's good to know that it's Lacroix. Yeah, exactly. So the the X you do as it was never there. So Lacroix. Okay. And Lacroix. I think that's pretty much. Oh no. Okay. There is also uh, Raphael Gladu. I think he's going to be the right fielder. So G L A D U. So it's Gladu. Yeah. Raphael Gladu. 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 Okay. Gladu. <laughs> Gladu. <laughs> it's insanely entertaining to be talking to Tim Calderwood right now and just to be. <laughs> Just be helping him to pronounce some Quebec names. I mean, it's unreal. I expect you to watch this week on Twitter and message me immediately when I say some of these names wrong, if I say them wrong. My, uh, I, I made my, not made, my girlfriend is actually a, almost as big as a baseball fan as I am. And she's working for the Capitals right now because of me. And we will be watching tonight and for the three games. And if you want, if you want me to call in or something, can, can you patch me in? Okay, probably. I could probably figure it out. <laughs> that, would, that would be awesome. And just to be able to talk baseball with you on the air. I, I, I mean, I'm just throwing it out there, okay? Uh, okay, so, so I have, I have uh, Vincent Ruel. Uh, Ruel, Ruel. Ruel, okay. Ruel, yeah. Ruel, okay. And then is it Gauthier? Oh, yeah, David Gauthier. It's Gauthier. Gauthier. Gauthier, okay. Yeah. Oh, do you know the um the, the like designer? Peltier, except it's Gautier. Yeah, do, do you know the designer uh Cartier C R C A R T E R T I E R? Like I think they, they do uh they Cartier, do... yeah. Yeah, so Andrew it's Cartier, Gautier. he's on our team. Yeah, there you go. So now you have De David Gautier. Gautier. Car okay, got it. Perfect. Okay. It is. And then I think that's pretty much it. Paiva? Cody Paiva? Yeah, Cody Paiva is from Honolulu. Aha, okay. I, I All right. I, I, am I crazy or it, was he announced as the, the pitcher tonight? Uh, no. Tonight is Cienfuegos. Oh, it, oh, he's still back on. Oh, perfect. I think you'll get uh, Cienfuegos, Paiva, and then uh, Cody would make sense. Okay. All right. Yeah, well, I'm excited because, like I said, we've been playing a lot of Windy City and Joliet's, and so it's going to be fun to get a different team in. Yeah, and uh, Windy City are up right now. So, Tim, please, please take care of yourself. It's been an hour-long interview. Wow. And, yeah. and to be quite honest with you, I've enjoyed every second of it, and I'm not cutting anything. Now, I've watched enough of your videos to know that you also have a little sarcasm in you, Dave. So are you sure about that? I... <laughs> I, I am the definition of sarcasm. 
no, 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 there is no sarcasm at all, man. It was, uh, I, I truly did uh, enjoy every second of it. It was an honor and a privilege to talk to you. And I do mean it, uh, uh, every word of it. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Like I said, I've missed uh, having videos to watch. I, I literally put them on while I'm in here doing notes and stuff. And I'm like, oh, that's an interesting note. And then I'll write it down and reference it later. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, let's keep in touch. And tonight we will be watching live. So if you want to make some cracks at me and uh, <laughs> about this about this very short interview, uh, <laughs> you can you can go ahead. I can take it. No problem. Sounds like a plan, buddy. I appreciate it. Thanks for the time. I, I appreciate it too, man. Have a good one.